Hello everybody, my name is Brad. I'm with the Little Travers Conservancy and today I'm very, very excited to be sharing some information about some of the frogs and toads that we have up here in northern Michigan. So let's go ahead and jump in. The first thing I want to talk about is uh, just amphibians as a whole instead of uh, just frogs and toads. So here in Michigan we've got about 26 species uh, of amphibians. Of that 26, 12 of them are going to be salamanders. We have six true frogs, which um, true frogs are just the ones that tend to hang out in ponds like a bullfrog or something. We have six tree frogs and only two different species of toads that we'll talk about. Many of those species of amphibians are fairly common, but others are uh, pretty rare. We've even got some endangered species here in Michigan, and all of them are illegal to take from the wild and to own as pets. So unfortunately, you can't take any amphibians home. Uh, we'll start off again really basic with what makes an amphibian so that everybody's familiar with what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, an amphibian is going to be like our frog, toad, even salamanders and newts. Um, all amphibians are going to need water in some degree to complete their life cycle. Um, some only need water to lay eggs where others are going to stay near water their entire lives. And we'll talk about uh, the ones that might be um, one way or the other. All of our amphibians are cold-blooded, so they have to get their heat from their environment. They can't make their own heat. And they're all also vertebrates, just like us, so they all have a backbone. All of our amphibians can breathe and absorb water uh, and chemicals through their really, really thin skin. Their uh, young, like a tadpole, are going to have gills for breathing in the water. And some adults, actually, some salamanders, uh, lack lungs entirely. They don't even need them anymore because they're so good at getting oxygen through their skin. And our last one here, all of our amphibians are going to undergo metamorphosis, some type of body change. So like I just mentioned, our tadpole, they're going to grow up and have legs. Eventually, they're going to um, lose their gills and they're going to come out of the water. We're going to take a look at that life cycle in the next slide. So... Here's our basic life cycle of a, a typical frog. Um, they're going to start off in the top right as eggs. Those eggs are going to hatch into tadpoles that have gills. And eventually, as the summer goes on, those tadpoles are going to grow legs. They'll start to lose their gills. And eventually, they'll grow all four limbs, and they can hop out of the water and be an adult frog. Between frogs and toads, we're going to get a little bit more specific uh, before we talk about each species. Our frogs on the left-hand side have a few characteristics that are a lot different from the toads that we might see. So all of our frogs are going to have smooth skin uh, that helps them move quicker in the water. They don't really need um, these, these bumps like a toad does. So toads are going to have dry, really warty skin. Our frogs, again, are going to have uh, pretty long legs for hopping and leaping, whereas our toads have a bit shorter legs. They still have those long back legs for hopping along the ground, but they don't need to be as long for swimming. Uh, again, on our left with our frogs, frogs are all going to have small waists, where our toads tend to have a little bit wider waists. Uh, frogs don't really have any enlarged poison glands, uh, like we'll see on our toads, who do have some nice big poison glands on their neck. Frogs can leap into the air, where toads are going to hop along the ground. And finally, our frogs are going to live a lot of times uh, pretty close to water or inside the water, where our toads, because they've got that little bit drier, thicker, warty skin, they can live in some drier habitats. Um, and they only need to go to the water to lay their eggs. Here at the bottom of the slide, I've got a quiz for everybody. Uh, can you get warts from handling a toad? I'll let you think about that for just a second. Can toads give you warts, right? If you pick one up, well, the answer is no. Toads cannot give you warts. Um, even if they pee on you, even if you handle them, uh, picking up a toad is not going to give you a wart, unfortunately. So here is our first two species of toads. On our left, we've got an American toad. And on, all, along the bottom, I've got uh, some funny mug shots that somebody put together for our toads. Uh, if we look at the picture of our American toad, on his belly, you can see a bunch of little chocolate chip marks all over his, his stomach. It's going to be speckled. If we compare that to our other species on the right-hand side, that is our fowler's toad. Our fowler's toad does not have uh, very many spots at all. Sometimes they don't have a single spot on their entire belly. 
And that's how we're going to uh, tell the two species apart. Our American toad is really common uh, pretty much everywhere in the state of Michigan. And our fowler's toad has kind of a strange distribution. They, they don't show up everywhere. We'll take a picture or we'll uh, look at a picture of, of what their range looks like in the next couple slides. This is our American toad. You can see him there on the bottom looking very proud of himself again with all of those chocolate chip spots on its belly. These are found all over Michigan. Um, they don't have very specific habitat requirements, so they can live um, just about anywhere that has maybe some woods or a pond or something like that. So they're going to eat almost any bug or invertebrate or insect that they can fit into their mouth, anything they encounter while they're hopping along the ground. And uh, one of my favorite things about the toads, they can uh, they, they keep a little reserve of water inside themselves so that when somebody, somebody picks them up or maybe a predator tries to eat them, they can squirt that water out their back end, uh, hopefully into the mouth or maybe the eyes of whatever might be trying to attack them. So that is a, a really effective predator deterrent. If you've ever uh, picked up a toad and experienced that, um, you, you'll know firsthand how, how much you want to put that toad down after they pee on you. And uh, an important note about their eggs, uh, all of the toads are going to lay eggs in these long strands that you can see in the bottom left there. They're these long uh, chains, almost like a, a necklace in the water. A lot of our other uh, frogs are going to lay eggs maybe in clumps, uh, or salamanders also are going to lay eggs in clumps. So that's how you can tell the eggs apart. When we look at our range map, that picture of Michigan that I put on this slide, every, um, everywhere in red is where that particular species has been found in the last 10 years. Um, they've been officially documented by the state to be living in that particular county. And the lucky thing for us is that the frogs, they don't read these maps and the toads don't read them either. So any of the spaces that are not filled in red, it doesn't mean they don't exist there, it just means nobody's found one yet. So they could still be somewhere in that area. We're gonna move on to our next uh, toad species which is our Fowler's Toad. Uh, this is the one that doesn't have any chocolate chip marks you can see in that bottom middle picture. Um, and you can tell from the bottom left, they almost, on the top, they almost look identical to our American Toad. So we really gotta look at that belly for them. They've got a little bit different sound than our American Toad. The American Toad makes this high, like chirp or trill uh, kind of sound. The Fowler's Toad is gonna be a lower, um, lower pitch sound like a wah kind of thing so uh, if you're just listening to them that's how you can tell them apart and they tend to prefer uh, more open woodlands and sandier areas so a sandy prairie or a meadow if we look at that uh, range map again our picture of Michigan you can see them on the western side near the the Lake Michigan shoreline uh, but somebody did finally uh, find one up here in, in northern Michigan in Presque Isle County um, over there so uh, I always think that's pretty interesting. So, um, if you happen to find one, it would certainly be um, worth noting. That's a pretty exciting species to encounter out in the wild. We're going to move along to our tree frogs now. Our tree frogs are all going to be really great climbers. They've all got sticky toe pads, but only one of them actually likes to live up in the trees. Many of our species are very small and tend to live more in like a wetland or some cattails. But all of our uh, species are very loud and vocal. So what they, what they lack in size, they make up for in sound. These are great ones to, to be listening to uh, out there in the wetlands. Our first species is also our biggest. It is our eastern gray tree frog. Uh, you can see a picture of how he got his name right there, the gray coloration. Um, they love to live up in trees and a lot of times near wetlands. But even though they're called the gray tree frog, they're not always gray. They can actually change their color, uh, almost like a chameleon, but they really only have two settings, either gray or green. Um, and that just helps them suit their environment. So if they're hanging out on some bark on a tree, they want to turn gray. But if they're up in the leaves or maybe uh, down in some cattails, they're going to change their color to green. And they've also, if you look um, at the gray photo in the top right, you'll see some yellow. Uh, kind of on the foot and underneath the thigh. There are some really interesting theories about why they might have that coloration, but I think um, the one to me that makes the most sense is uh, they, they keep that yellow hidden. 
while they're camouflaged. But let's say a, a snake or something gets lucky and it starts to sniff out this frog. Uh, that frog is going to keep that yellow coloration tucked in until the very last second, until it jumps away. And all of a sudden that snake sees a bright yellow flash of something, something around its environment. So now that snake in its head is thinking, well, I just saw something yellow. I'm going to keep an eye out for yellow stuff. So now it's got yellow kind of stuck in its head. Meanwhile, the frog is, has jumped over to a different part of the tree and has tucked that yellow back up so it can't be seen anymore. Uh, and it's kind of deterred the predator, uh, hopefully. So um, that's just one of the theories. Uh, it'd be fun to, to make up your own. We'll move on to our next species, our northern spring peeper. Um, peepers are named for their sound. Um, they're very, very small, uh, almost maybe the size of your thumb or sometimes even smaller. And these guys are really easy to identify uh, by the X on their back. I'm going to put up an X over top of it there. So they've got that mark um, that kind of goes from shoulder to hip and back again. And these guys... Uh, they, they don't have a really specific habitat. They'll hang out just about anywhere from ponds to marshes and even ditches during the, the springtime when it's nice and wet. Eventually, once those areas kind of dry up, like a ditch is going to dry up, these peepers will disperse into the woods or maybe in, even into a field or a shrubby area. And again, that, that peep, you can hear it from uh, a long ways away. These guys are really, really loud. Um biologists a lot of times will wear earplugs if they're sampling for spring peepers just because uh, they're so loud if you're too close they can actually hurt your ears. Our next species is the western chorus frog. They're uh, almost the same size as a spring peeper but instead of an X going across their back they've got three uh, stripes going long ways down their back so that's an easy way to tell them apart. Uh, they prefer more open habitats like a, a marsh or a wet meadow, something like that. So they don't like a lot of trees and they seem to be awfully shy. Um, you'll definitely hear them uh, before you can see them. This is not an, an easy species to, uh, to find. Up next we're going to switch from tree frogs to our true frogs. Uh, the term true frog is it doesn't really have a ton of meaning it's just used to separate um, this group from other frogs like the tree frogs but uh, when you think of a true frog just think of a typical like pond and lily pad type of frog so like a bullfrog or a green frog or something like that uh, they don't have any sticky pads for climbing but they've got these really really big back legs for leaping uh, in, in either into the water, maybe out of the water, or also swimming within the water. And these guys all prefer more permanent bodies of water, like a pond or a lake, as opposed to maybe our ditch that's going to dry up later in the summer. Our first species is the green frog. Uh, the green frog is probably our most abundant amphibian species in the entire state. And they're nearly identical to a bullfrog that we'll look at next, except if you look really close, I'm going to put up a red line here. If you look really close underneath that red line, there's this little flap of skin. And that flap of skin runs all the way from their eye, almost down, all the way to their legs. So keep an eye out for that flap. Usually it's pretty easy to see, even when they're in the water. And their call is this really, really funny um, sound. People uh, call it like a, a pluck of one banjo string. It's this really little, like a go kind of sound. So they're, um, they're a fun one to listen for. They will be calling uh, after all of our toads and tree frogs. These guys like to call more into the early summer and midsummer type seasons. Here's our next species, our big bullfrog. Uh, if we look, um, that wrinkle that we saw on the green frog is no longer present. There is a wrinkle though, and it goes from their eye and kind of curls around. You can see that disc shape that the arrow is pointing to. That disc on the side of their head is actually their ear. Uh, it works almost exactly like a drum. It kind of vibrates, and that's how they, they hear the other frogs calling. So that, that little wrinkle or fold of skin, instead of going down their back, it just curls right around their ear, right to their shoulder. Uh, bullfrogs are really funny because they'll eat um, anything, anything, anything that they think they can fit in their mouth. So, uh, it's not, it's not uncommon to see frogs trying to eat pretty, pretty big fish if they can catch them. Or, um, I've even been told 
Uh, frogs can eat mice um, from time to time if they're fast enough to catch them, which I think is pretty impressive, pretty bold. Their call, instead of just one kind of thunk sound, uh, they produce um, this this uh, much, I guess, lower pitched um, drum rum type sound. Uh, so, or it's kind of like a boom boom. It's really, really low, and it's going to be. Um, they're going to be calling kind of in the evenings. These are a lot more common down in southern Michigan, but they do get up here. Um, every so often, you'll be able to spot one. But when you're looking to try and tell them from a green frog, just look for that fold of skin that goes around the ear instead of down the back. Next, we've got our northern leopard frog. Um, they're uh, found pretty commonly across all of Michigan. We've got plenty of them up here. Um, and they're named for those spots that kind of irregularly blotch up along their back. Um, they've also got those nice uh, stripes going across their legs. It's a really, really pretty frog. Um, they make this really goofy, uh, almost like a snore type call. Um, a lot of frogs are going to call on top of the water. Leopard frogs don't always do that. A lot of times they're uh, underneath the water, even buried in mud, making this like kind of low rumbly snoring call. It almost sounds like um, like a woodpecker a little bit. So it's one of my favorite species to find. I think they're pretty goofy. Up next, we're going to compare this one to the leopard frog that we just looked at. This is called a pickerel frog. And these guys are uh, fairly uncommon, um, but they are found up here. They require some really, really high quality habitat. They do not tolerate any type of human disturbance. So they really need um, uh, nice preserved areas um, with no, no pollution, no houses being built, nothing like that. They really need a nice clean environment. And compared to our leopard frog that had those irregular just spots all over its back, these spots on the pickerel frog are very, very organized. Uh, they're nice and clean, rectangular in sets of two that go right down the back. So they're, they're very neat and organized compared to the leopard frog, and that's an easy way to tell them apart. Um, strangely enough, the, the name pickerel frog comes from um, them uh, in the old days um, being caught to be used for bait uh, to catch um, pickerel. Uh, the word pickerel is, in, is an old name that people used to use for uh, walleye. So people would go out, catch these frogs, and then they'd go walleye fishing with them. So they were used so often uh, for bait that, that it became their name, which I think is pretty unfortunate for these guys. Up next, we've got the mink frog. Unfortunately, the mink frog uh, is not found in the lower peninsula. But like I said, uh, fortunately, these frogs don't read the maps, so they can always maybe pop up somewhere. They've got this really, really unique... Um, knocking call, almost like uh, that sound you can make with your tongue, like a <coughs> like that. Um, it's, a, it's a really weird one to hear. And they're named mink frog, um, not because they're fast or because they're kind of brown or anything, but it's because they smell bad. Um, mink are known to be a pretty musky animal. Uh, if you're not familiar with the mink, it's, it's uh, part of the weasel family. Uh, we've got them up here. They, they prefer wet areas, but they've, um, they've got this really, really um, unique uh, kind of musky smell that uh, can be a little bit irritating, actually. So with our mink frogs, if you were to grab one and pull them out of the water, these frogs, they smell like mink musk. Uh, people compare it to like rotting onions. They really, really do not smell good. And the easiest way to um, identify them, either by their smell or by their call, also we have these kind of blotchy uh, spots all over their skin. It's not in any type of pattern. Uh, it seems like it's just these weird kind of brown and green uh, blotches that go across their whole body. And this is our last species that we're going to cover um, today. This is also one of our very easiest ones to identify. This is the wood frog. They're a really, really common species as long as you look at the right time of year. So that's going to be April through maybe mid-May. That's always during the breeding season for this frog. Um, our best ID characteristic is going to be their little bandit mask that runs across their face. Um, they're going to be kind of brownish or sometimes they can be more of a maroon, kind of a reddish color. And they're also uh, one of the earliest species to show up in the spring. Um, they're known as explosive breeders. So once the ice kind of thaws, they're going to be running to, to uh, some ponds or even vernal pools uh, to go lay some eggs. They've got 
uh, a very unique call as well. It sounds uh, almost exactly like a duck uh, quacking. Um, with this presentation, I've put uh, YouTube links to each species call on the slides, uh, so you can go back and, and revisit them. And the wood frog is one that I would definitely recommend listening to because uh, if you're in the woods and you hear some wood frogs, you'll probably get fooled um, by thinking they, uh, they might be a duck. So that was our last species. Um, I want to thank you so much uh, for following along with me and learning about some of our frogs and toads we've got uh, up here in Michigan. It's never a bad time to uh, go out and look for some of these guys. Uh, if you are looking for frogs or even salamanders, uh, the best time to do it is in the evenings. Uh, they move a lot of times in the evenings when there's not going to be birds around, and they really like it when it's, it's uh, kind of a warm evening with some rain happening. That's when a lot of these um, are going to be active. So I wish you some happy hunting. I uh, hope you can go out and find some of them soon. And thank you so much for your kind attention.